right now the court has before it probably more than one case, but in uh, this instance, a particular case that really goes to the scope of our rights under the Constitution. Uh, and in particular, it's the right to decide whether or not to end a pregnancy. Um, so in 1973, the Supreme Court recognized that that right was protected by the Constitution. In 1992, in a case called Casey versus Planned Parenthood versus uh, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court reconsidered again. Um, and as a result, we have sort of a constitutional test or standard for determining to what extent state or state legislatures um, can restrict access to abortion. Um, and so the standard has been since the 20th century, um, the idea that after viability in a pregnancy, a state legislature can choose to ban abortion with some exceptions available to protect the health and safety of the mother um, or the pregnant woman. Um, and the test that's used for regulations that apply before viability is one that the court articulated in 1992 in the Casey decision. So they use the terms um, undue burden and substantial obstacle, meaning that if a state law imposes an undue burden on access to abortion, then it's unconstitutional. And if it falls below that level, then it's constitutional. So that's why we do have state laws that restrict access to abortion, um, but um, or that regulate the way that abortion can be offered um, and services that can be provided. But we still have a guarantee that in every state, um, the legislatures can't foreclose abortion altogether. But now that's all on the line. Um, so in the late fall, the Supreme Court heard arguments in a case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And they're considering a state law passed by the Mississippi legislature that would ban abortion for 15 weeks. 15 weeks as well before, before the point of viability. Um, and so that raises the question of whether or not there is a constitutional right um, to abortion or whether state legislatures would have the power to override access to abortion. Um, and it looks like they might do that. So kind of scaling back a little bit. So we know what's going on right now and let's clear up Roe v. Wade in terms of what is it? And I'm going like hyper-focused right here because <laughs> okay. I, I know it as, I've heard it referred to as the law of the land, but it's a court ruling. So it's not a law. It is a law. It, it is a law. Yeah. In the but, United States, our laws are made by different actors, if you will, government actors, if you will. So certainly when we think of laws, we think of statutes as enacted either by Congress or by state legislatures. Um, but courts also have the power to make law. So they have the authority to interpret statutes in some cases, but they also have the law to create what we call common law. Um, in the constitutional cases like Roe versus Wade or Casey versus Planned Parenthood, what they're doing is in their, their thinking about challenges to state laws. So they're considering the balance between what the constitution says and what the constitution protects on the one hand, and then what's the scope of legislative authority on the other hand. And let's kind of launch off from there. Misconceptions surrounding Roe v. Wade. Uh, you know, you're a teach, you're a professor at UC Davis, certainly you probably had your fair share of questions about it. Um, just from your experience, well, what are some of the more common misconceptions people have about Roe v. Wade? Um, I think one of the basic questions is what happens if Roe v. versus Wade is struck down across the nation? So there won't be one national outcome under this, what the Supreme Court would say and what it says in the draft opinion that was leaked um, is, that, is that a majority of the Supreme Court might determine um, that there is no constitutional right um, to decide whether or not to end a pregnancy and that means it leaves the issue to the state legislatures and the state governors. So that means in some states, the state legislatures could decide to enact bans or very severe restrictions on access to abortion. But in other states, they might step forward and several states have already done so to provide strong protections um, for the right to decide. So California being one of those states. So in some states, um, access to abortion 
already exists and will continue it to exist. It may even expand, and in other states, it may shrink. You know, th there was this, if you listen to a lot of the pundits, um, go on YouTube anywhere, when they talk about this, a, a fair amount of them will talk about uh, the judicial branch trying to legislate from the bench, and that the, the <laughs> that portion of the government is supposed to say, this is constitutional, not constitutional. When you bring up Roe v. Wade, people talk about you're legislating from the bench, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, so for context, do you know what exactly they're talking about and is Roe v. Wade an example of that? I'm not, I, I'm not sure that it is an example of that. So that there are sort of two different angles um, on that particular point. So one is it comes from um, an interpret, a way of interpreting the constitution um, that's often called textualism. Another, ver another version of that is originalism. And you see the, the sort of conservative majority in Alito's draft using that particular approach. So it's a way of reading the constitution and in particular, this interpreting the scope of our individual rights very narrowly by saying that it, we need to see language in express words in the constitution in order to recognize it as a right. Um, and so repeatedly in Alito's draft opinion, it says that the right to decide is not anywhere expressed in the Constitution. Um, when the court recognized the right to decide, it did so as part of a string of cases in which the court sort of developed this area of what's called substantive due process under the right of privacy. Um, Alito's other point is that nowhere in the Constitution does the court set out a right of privacy um, as it was defined by the court in cases like that recognize, for example, the right to marry or the right to decide or the right to access contraception. Um, and so by interpreting the Constitution um, in a way which recognizes those types of personal decisions as constitutional rights, some people would say what they're doing is legislative. They're making things up. And that's the role for legislators, not for the courts. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. The other point that Alito makes in the draft opinion is that Roe looks like a piece of legislation because it's, it's a, he sets out a, the, the court in 1973 set out a framework um, for that legislatures could, dis, could use to determine which laws would be um, permissible, constitutionally permissible, and which types of abortion regulations would not be. So that's known as the trimester framework. It was rejected by the court in 1992 in the Casey decision. But repeatedly, Alito says it's so detailed that that's like legislation. That's not what we should be doing. Just kind of following up on these talking points that I hear a lot. I heard this idea of settled law. Uh, I, I don't know if it was from Elizabeth Warren or from someone else, <clears throat> um, but I heard an idea of settled law. And when you talk about Roe v. Wade and the abortion debate, my goodness, it's one of the most heated and passionate arguments of our lifetime. How on earth could any, anyone say settled about this debate? So how, how exactly do those things coexist? Well, I think there's a distinction, an important distinction to think about. But on the one hand, you can have a settled law. And on the, on the other hand, you can have um, a very heated and persistent um, political and moral debate. Um, about how that law is used. Um, so I think it's important to draw that line and not conflate the two. We have many such laws that are contested in political discourse. That doesn't necessarily mean that they should be um, taken away. You mentioned it earlier, and this was the idea that it, if it does get struck down, there, there are many states who may... Um, do what they will with the concept of abortion, what you can and what you can't do. Um, it may, maybe it's more of the political end of things, but I guess there's a lot of people who would say, well, great, it's kind of supposed to be that way. If, if we have so many people who disagree and won't budge from either side, does it make sense to have something so overarching? Why not just leave it to the individual states and you know, let our democracy run its course. Well, I think in a sense, that's what the draft opinion indicates. Um, if, it's, if it's so contested, um, then this is something that should be decided by what Alito refers to as the democratic process. So it's something that our elected officials 
um, should have the responsibility of addressing on a state by state basis. And certainly we do that with many other types of laws. Um, most of the laws that state legislatures have the authority to do that with are basic health and safety laws. Um, I think the response to that point is that this one's different. It um, secures um, the ability to have the say-so over your own body um, um, and without state interference, without go government interference over that. And it also does so in a way that is highly gendered. Are there civil ways for someone who is for abortion rights and someone who you know, wants to protect the unborn, is there a way to, for them to find a middle ground to, uh, or even just have a pleasant conversation about the topic without it being so heated? Can we talk about this civilly? Um, I think many people are doing that. Um, it's just, you know, we, the, I mean, you started the conversation by pointing out that the term sort of pro-choice and pro-life or anti-abortion are the terms that are most often used to describe um, this debate, but those are two ends of a much richer discussion. Um, and I think all the polls indicate that a substantial majority of people in the United States support some access to abortion. So they might disagree over the details and the scope of the ability to exercise that decision. Um, but the su substantial majority are sort of meeting in the middle already on that point. And I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't toss it over to you. Any last comments, any, any kind of burn in the uh, statements you got on your mind that you just wanted to uh, put out there? I think it's very important to remember about, to remember, sort of keep in mind um, who will be impacted primarily by these laws. It's the people who, are, who lack resources to travel um, and who don't already have full access to, to health care. Um, so it's the same people who've been hit the hardest by the COVID pandemic, and now they're adding something else on top of that.